that we will serve the Lord. Father, we thank you for that blood that was shed at Calvary. That blood that washes every sin, that cleanses us, Father. Lord, I just thank you that you paid that price even before the foundation of the world it was determined that you would be the lamb slain. Lord, I thank you that you did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Lord, I give you praise. I give you glory. In Jesus' name. Let's take the cup. Thank him again for that price that was paid. You couldn't do it, but he did it for you. Lord, I thank you for that blood that heals. I thank you for that blood that saves. I thank you for that blood that fills with your Holy Spirit, Father. Touch the hearts of your people here this morning. Let your Holy Spirit come in this place, Father. Fill every heart. Open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, that we might know you and walk with you this day, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Kids can go ahead and be dismissed if they're going. Amen. Are you thankful this morning? Yes, amen. Are you thankful that God visits His people? Amen. amen. I am too. I'm glad everybody's here this morning. Glad to see you here. Miss those that aren't. Pray for those that aren't here this morning. Look around, see who's not here. Pray for them. You know, we need to be praying for one another. We're going to see that here this morning. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 1. But we need to be praying for one another. We need to be lifting each other up in this day and age. We need to be praying for our, 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 our families. I, need, I, be, I pray for your family. You need to be praying for my families and the other families in this church that God would hold them up. That God would give unto them all that they have need of in Christ Jesus. Don't ever neglect that. We're going to see that. We're going to Philippians. We're going to start in chapter 1 of verse 1. But just a little bit of background on Philippians. Philippians was that city, that place where in Acts chapter 16, Paul had seen that vision of the man in Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Paul and Silas and those that were with him, you know, they were, they were saying there in the chapter before that in Acts, they were saying, hey, let's, let's go over here and then, oh no, let's go over there. And the Holy Spirit was saying, no, don't go there. Don't go here. And thankfully, Paul... And the companions that were with him, they had the mind of the Lord. They were listening to the Lord. They were hearing what God had to say because it's this, 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 that portion of Scripture there in Acts where Paul, obeying the, the unction of the Holy Spirit when he saw that vision, went over into Macedonia, Macedonia being the first place on European soil where the gospel came the place of Philippi being one of the chief cities of Macedonia where trade was, was made and where people were coming and going. It was there that Paul would establish the church and it was there that, that Paul would write this letter to that church. Philippians here is, is really not a letter of, of reprimand. It's not a letter of uh, trying to correct a wrong teaching that was there, but it's rather a letter of encouragement. Uh, one of the main uh, 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 themes of Philippians is the all-sufficiency of Christ. That's something that we need to be hearing today in the church. That's something that's missing in the heart and the life of the believer today in the church is realizing that all that we need for life and godliness is found in Christ. It's not found in the world it's not found in the world's system, the world's uh, 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 music. It's not found in the world's entertainment. It's not found in the devices of the world such as psychology and things of that nature. 
but it's found we are the all sufficiency Christ is enough. Amen. He is enough for you today, yesterday, for, for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What you need is found in Jesus Christ. If you'll just reach out, if you'll just call out to Him, if you'll just ask Him, He said He would be there, that He would never leave us or forsake us, but that He would, would be there when we call to Him. Amen. Amen. Our sister last week preached, Come unto me. That's an invitation for you today. Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Are you burdened down with the cares of this life? Are you burdened down with the ways of the... Are you burdened down with the news mm. of this world? Jesus says, come to me. What an invitation. And He didn't say, come to me, some of you, but He said, come to me, all of you. And he said, I'm going to give you some rest. We can rest from the toils of this world and this life if we'll just simply trust Him and call out to Him. See, you're not going to call to someone you're not trusting. And He has all that you need. He don't just have it, He is it. I know it's, we often say has. Has puts the, uh, the, uh, the thought in our mind, I guess, that God's got a pantry. And he's got it full of whatever you need. He's got it full. And, and he ain't got a pan. He is the pantry. If you want to look at it that way. He doesn't have it just stored up there. And you know, whenever it runs out, he's got to run out and get more or make more. He is our all-sufficient one. He is. And he don't ever run out because he is. And we don't ever run out of him. He don't ever run out of himself, however you want to look at it. But he is all that we need. Paul's writing this letter to the Philippians. I got a lot of red notes in here. We're going to try to get down to the first 11 or so verses here. We'll see how far we get. But Paul is writing this letter to encourage them and to thank them. The church at Philippi was one of the few churches that, that supported Paul. Supported him financially. They would send brothers to him. Paul is writing this letter from his first time being imprisoned in Rome. He's writing this letter from prison. And if you'll notice, you go on down through there, and Paul, he won't be complaining about where he's at, but he's saying, where I'm at, God has put me here for the furtherance of the gospel. Oh my. How much you and I need to learn from that one. The trial that we're going through, our situation, what we're seeing come about, God has put us there for the furtherance of the gospel. If you're a believer, you don't go through anything but that God hasn't designed it for you and allowed it. Go read Job. That devil, he, didn't, he, he knew he couldn't get to Job. He wasn't even messing with him. He said, yeah, but I can't touch him. But God said, okay, I'll, I'll let you in. And you can only go this far. You see, whatever the trial you're going through, the devil trying to tear you down, but God's saying, you can only go so far. We don't know what we can handle, but God knows. Oftentimes we cry out and we say, God, I can't handle this anymore. But God's saying, yes, my strength is sufficient for you. He is sufficient for you today. If you don't go away with anything else, go away with that. That God is sufficient. And He's taking care of you. And you can rest in that. Amen? Amen. Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to read a few verses and then we're going to go back over them here. Maybe I'll read all of it down to 11 just so that we see it. Then we'll come back. Paul and Timothy. The servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, 
that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Amen, amen. and amen, amen. Father, touch the hearts of your people this morning in Jesus' name. So Paul starts this out. He's identifying himself with Timothy. He's saying we are the servants or the bond slaves of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, He's excluded none. He's giving this letter to all. It was meant to be read to each and every person there in Philippi. They were to understand the care and the love and the concern that Paul had for them. How we need some believers today. We need some pastors today. This is what Paul is saying here it is, that I love you and I care for you and I'm thinking about you on a continual basis and I would that God would give to you all that you have need of. We need some preachers today and we need some people in the pew today who will say that of their brothers and their sisters and say, I'm remembering you when I pray. Are you praying today? Hmm. First, we need to understand that prayer is a privilege. Prayer is not a duty. Paul is not saying when I have to go into prayer. Paul is saying when I go to prayer, when I pray. Paul says to pray continually without ceasing. That doesn't mean we have to be on our knees in our closet all the time. But we need to be in constant. Prayer is communion and fellowship and talking. Mm, Like we said this morning. When we're worshiping Him, we're walking with Him in the cool of the day. We're walking with Him side by side and giving Him praise and glory. When we pray to the Lord, we're not just asking for stuff for ourselves, but we're thanking God for all that He's done, all that He's going to do. We're thanking God that He has brought each other You and I together in this place that He has brought whoever it is into our lives. You see, God brings into our lives those that He intends to use to to build us up, to teach us about Himself a lot of times. You know, you don't associate with who you associate by accident. Saved or unsaved. God has an intent for those who are lost for you to preach the gospel to them. For you to live that gospel message to them. For those who are saved, for iron to sharpen iron. For us to edify and build up one another. That's why we come together in this place. is to edify and to build one another up. That's what Paul's talking about here. They're the bond slaves of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to all the saints. And he includes the bishops and deacons in that. All the saints. Sometimes bishops and deacons are anything but saints. <laughs> you know? He says, grace be to you and peace. That word grace there is cheris. It means to rejoice. It's grace particularly that causes joy This is what the grace of God does in our hearts and lives when it's shed abroad. It causes joy, pleasure, gratification. It's favor, acceptance. It's for a kindness granted or desired, a benefit, thanks, gratitude, a favor done without the expectation of return, the absolutely free expression of the loving kindness of God to men 
finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of the giver, its unearned and unmerited favor, and it stands in direct contrast to works. So Paul is saying that there might be more grace, more of God's favor, more of the joy of the Holy Spirit, more of that peace, because peace is part of that as well. That sanctifying peace is what he's talking about here. Knowing, knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything is right with me and my Savior, that everything is right with me and the Lord God Almighty. We can have a peace knowing that we are His and He is ours. I am the Lord's and the Beloved's and the Beloved is mine, however that song goes. What God wants us to have is peace. Are you missing peace? Call out to the Lord. Reach out to Him. Grace and peace. Where does it come from? God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when He puts that in there, it totally excludes you and I. Like we said there, grace is the total opposite of works. When you're trying to earn God's favor by your works, when you're trying to earn God's favor by what you're doing or what you're saying or what you're giving or whatever, there's not going to be peace. You realize that? Because we're always going to come up short. We're going to come up short even in the laws, if you will, even in the... uh, 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 principles or the rituals that we set up for ourselves or or that we allow to be set up for us by others in whatever the group or denomination might be. But there will always, as long as we're trying to live for God by means of rules or rituals or doctrines of man or whatever it might be, there will always be a lack of peace because we will always, always be coming up short. It's only as we put our faith and our trust in who Jesus is and what He did for us at Calvary, that we can find true peace, that peace that Jesus gives to us. Hmm. Are you living a life of turmoil, trying to live for the Lord by your own strength and ability? That song we sung this morning, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit, saith the Lord. This mountain shall be removed, whatever that mountain is. Whether it's a mountain of works, whether it's a mountain of sickness, a mountain of whatever. God says, put your trust in me, and by my Spirit this thing shall be removed. What are you trusting in today? Amen. Is there peace today? If there's no peace in the situation, be trusting in the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Hmm. What a privilege. What a privilege it is to pray. To come into His presence. To walk with Him. Oh my. To have that fellowship restored that Adam lost in the garden. has been restored to us by Jesus Christ. And what he did at Calvary's cross. Mm. You can have that fellowship today. If you don't know that fellowship, you can have it today. Just call to him. Put your trust in him. Grace and peace that comes from God, our Father. Ooh, What do we know about that? God's not just a God out there. But he's your heavenly Father. Hmm. He's your heavenly Father. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Everything we need we find in Him. God is your Father. And if God is your Father, what do you have to be worried about? You don't have to worry about every demon. Every demon in hell can come against you. But if God is your Father and you are trusting in Him, it don't matter because greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. And God is my Father. And every demon we can say, Get thee behind me. Be gone in the name of Jesus. (coughs) I was reading and doing some study on, on a message that the Lord may have me bring before too long. But talking about signs and wonders and miracles. And I'm just thinking about Jesus as He walked this earth and the signs and the wonders and the miracles that took place in His life and what He did. He could come to the demon of Gadaria 
and he could cast those demons out. The demons that were causing that child to be thrown into the fire and he could cast those demons out and they were gone. Do you know today that you and I have that same authority in Christ Jesus? We have that same power dwelling within us if we will believe and trust Him to see miracles performed. Jesus sent out the 70 and they performed miracles in the name of Jesus. God's the same yesterday, today and forever. You and I, we can do those same miracles not for the sake of the miracle or the sign, the wonder, but in the name of Jesus that He would be glorified, that He would be praised and that men and women would know that there is a God in heaven. In Acts it says these signs shall follow. Jesus said these signs shall follow them that believe. Are they following us today? I don't want to get off on that message, but... We need to hear that today. Yes. That that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. Yes. Do you know the power it took to raise Him from the dead? It dwells in you and I today. Well, the church that says, oh, signs and wonders are for the bygone day. Poor, pitiful people. That's right. Hmm. Just go back and read the word. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to find grace and peace in any other place. Paul goes on in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I thank my God upon every, every time he thought about them. He would pray for them. How often do we think about each other? When we think about one another, we need to be praying for them. When I think about my brothers and my sisters, I need to be saying, Lord, and it doesn't have to be a lengthy, oh God, touch them this way, that way. It can just be said, Lord, bless them today. Lord, keep them today. Lord, yes, draw them to you. Draw their children to you. And then go on about whatever you were doing. You see, God will bring them to your remembrance. But He might be bringing somebody to your remembrance because they need prayer right then. Don't be so foolish as to think, oh, I'll pray for them whenever I get home and I have my prayer time. You're going to forget. I don't know how many times the Lord given me a word and I didn't write it down and I forgot it. I had to sit there or something. He would quicken something. And I'm like, I'm going to look that up. But I didn't write it down. I need to be teaching myself to write some things down. Because I get home and I'm like, what was I going to look up? <laughs> we all been there. Yep. You know? Be yielded yes. to the moving of the Spirit. Let Him be showing you. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you, <clears throat> for you all, making requests with joy. Do you know that joy there is the same word that he translated grace in the other place? That's what grace gives is there in verse 2. Verse 4, that joy is that same cherish because that's what grace brings is joy. But Paul is saying always, <laughs> not just sometimes, but always in every prayer of mine. Each time I go to prayer, he says, I'm remembering you and I'm making requests for you. What are those requests that Paul was making? Making requests that God would grow them. He tells us later on down here that God would bless them. That God would provide for them and keep them. Like I said, we need to be praying for one another. Hmm, I think we would be a lot more, or the church would be, have a, be walking in a lot more power if we were praying for each other more and more. Not that, that you know we make it a law. <coughs> But as the Lord brings it to our remembrance, if we'd just be praying for one another more and more, we'd be seeing the move of God, move of the Holy Spirit in each other's lives. And when we would come together, boy, there wouldn't be nobody sitting on their chairs just saying, oh yeah, ain't this something. Clap, clap once in a while. We'd be rejoicing. We'd be shouting. We'd be coming in with a testimony for God. 
giving praise and glory and honor to Him for all that He's provided, all that He's done. We'd have something if we'd be praying for each other during the day, during the week, and we come together, we'd be saying, do you know what God did for me today? Amen. Or this week? Hmm. He moved in my life. Yes. He healed me. He kept me. Yeah. That car, that truck was coming out of nowhere and my brakes just went wham! And it just went Glory. inches in front of me. Glory to God. Amen. Mm. You know God's able to do that? Yes, he is. Do you know how many times He probably has done that? Yeah. And we just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just how things go. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that was lucky. I want to tell you something. There ain't no such thing in luck in the life of the believer. It ain't luck. It's because God was watching over you. Yes. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him to deliver them. Amen. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He was thanking, these, thanking God for the help that the Philippians were given to him to take the gospel message to the rest of the world. You know, for your fellowship. These were... These weren't Jews. They didn't know, didn't understand probably the tithing principle. These weren't Jews. Whenever Paul went to Philippi, this is the time where he found Lydia and some other women and some other folks down at the river on the Sabbath day and he began to preach to them and give them the Word of God and they said, Ooh, yes, that comes down. That, that, that comes into my heart. Yes, I like that good news that I'm hearing. And out of that, that church was birthed there. It, 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 it was here. It was in Philippi where, <coughs> where Paul and Silas, as they were preaching this gospel, that that little demon-possessed girl, if you remember that story in Acts, that demon-possessed girl, she was going behind them, just kind of doing a, 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 a jeer or kind of doing some sarcasm, saying, these are the messengers of God who have come to show us the way of salvation. And they, she was causing problems and because of that demon, that demon spirit in her. And Paul got tired of it and he turned around and he said, come out of her. Amen. And it says it came out <coughs> that very same hour. Mm, I gotta get a drink. <coughs> this is that place where when that demon was cast out, the people of the city got upset. Mm, these people do exceedingly trouble our city. Boy, is the church trouble in the city today? Hmm. Or are we just going along, get along? How many times I've been in a church where it was don't rock the boat? Oh, we don't want to go out there and say abortion is wrong. Hold up any signs because, oh, that might make us look bad. Don't put the church name on that sign. Yeah. Take the cross off. We don't want the cross up there. Mm. But Paul was thanking God for their fellowship, for their giving, for their prayers. Their fellowship in the gospel because they were helping to support him to take that gospel message to the world. When we come to Christ, like I said, these folks weren't, weren't uh, they weren't Jews. They didn't really have a concept of the 10% thing and all that. But they knew that they wanted, they knew what God had done in their heart. And they said, what God has done for me, how can I hold it back? Perhaps Paul had told them when he was with them, as he did when he wrote to the church in Rome. And he said, we are debtors. We are debtors to give this gospel message to the world around us because of what God has done for us. We need to have the mindset and the attitude that we're going to do everything we can to share this gospel message with the world around us, whether it's by finances or by going out or by whatever means that God has given us. Are you willing to give of yourself that this gospel message might touch on their hearts and lives. You see, that's that love that the Holy Spirit produces in us. 
Because we have been loved because of the grace of God that His love is shed abroad in our hearts because of John 3 and 16 that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son because that love has been planted in us by the Holy Spirit. That love for us to, to, to want to have this gospel message preached to the rest of the world around us. You see, that's true love. Oftentimes this world thinks of love as... Uh, I think we talked about this Thursday evening a little bit. They, 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 they think of love, or I know we've talked about it. They think of love as accepting people regardless of whatever. Do you know you don't have to accept sin in your life or the lives of others? What is sin? Sin is what the Word of God says it is. I'm going to tell you homosexuality is sin. Selfishness is sin. Greed is sin. Covetousness is sin. Adultery, sleeping together before marriage, it's sin. <clears throat> Whatsoever is not of faith. That hits the believer pretty hard right there. Whatsoever is not of faith. Faith in Christ and what He did at Calvary is sin. Hmm. We can call sin, sin. And it's loving. Hear me. <coughs> it's loving to do so. We don't do it in a harsh manner. But it's to love somebody to say, you're going in the wrong path. I think I wrote that to the, the inmates this last, last week when we sent out the packets. It's to tell somebody, you're going the wrong direction. You're headed on a road that the bridge is out. You're going to fall off in the cliff. See, that's the direction of the majority of, of, of all of this world. They're headed in the wrong direction. They need you and I to stand out there like the sign does. It says, detour, stop, don't go this way, road out. Oh, but that's not loving, really. It's loving to just stand by the wayside and shoom, shoom, watch them all go off the cliff. God, <clears throat> God so loved the world. That he gave. You know, Jesus came. Whenever Jesus forgave somebody, what did he tell them? Go and sin no more. Mm. Want to be like Jesus? Go and sin no more. Tell them. It's not wrong to tell somebody they're going in a way of destruction. That's what Paul's talking about. They were supporting him in the gospel, taking the good news. You see, it's good news what Christ has done for us for the price that He's paid for us. That's good news. And it takes money for the world, for the gospel to go around this world. Simply put, it ain't free to send out them packets. The post office don't say, oh, this is going to prisoners and this is ministry. Oh, we'll do it to you for free. No. What was it? $70 this last time to send those packets out? It's getting more and more, folks. Like I encouraged them in that letter, we're in eight prisons now, nine, something like that, throughout this nation from one coast to the other. We may only have one person in there. Most of them we have more than one. <clears throat> but <clears throat> there's 35 men and one woman in those prisons. We're going to get in those women's prisons. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. This gospel is going to make a difference yeah. in the yeah. hearts and lives Amen. of people. This gospel is going to go. And, and I'm, I'm believing God that it ain't just touching 35 people. But they're sharing it with others that may not have ability or whatever or may not be at that, that, that place in their walk with the Lord where they've requested it for themselves because they're being shared with them from others. But I'm believing God that these men that are asking for this Bible and this study material, that God's using them. And there's a, there, there's a revival taking place in some of these places that it's touching their hearts and lives. But it takes money, and that's what Paul's talking about here. The fellowship of the gospel from the first day until now. He says, being confident, being assured of this very thing. Mm. Mm. Do you know whenever you're taking the gospel message to whoever, wherever, you can be confident. Let's look that word up. Persuaded, convinced, 
persuaded, being persuaded of this very thing, being convinced of this very thing. Understand, know this. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're at, if you're giving the gospel message, if you're preaching, if you're teaching, if you're saying, the Lord has, look what God has done for me, He'll do it for you. If you're taking this gospel message and you're pouring it in to the heart and the life of somebody else, you can have confidence knowing that the Holy Spirit is going to take that word that was spoken into those hearts and lives and it is going to produce some fruit. It's going to have an effect one way or the other. We can know that God's word will not come back void. That when we give it, it's going to accomplish that for which it was set out to do. We can be confident because it's God's Word. Because it's the Gospel. Whenever we pray for one another, when we pray for our lost loved ones, our wives, our husbands, our children, we can be confident. We can be assured. We can know that because we have petitioned the Father and He hears our prayers, that He's going to move in those situations and those circumstances. And though we may not see it with our eyes right now, but God is going to accomplish something <coughs> in their lives. Hmm. A settled assurance. I think that's the problem with a lot of the church today. We're not confident in God's Word. We're not confident to stand upon His Word and say, I don't care what I see with my eyes. I know my God is able to touch. He is able to heal. He is able to deliver. He is able to set free those who are bound. My God is able. And I'm confident knowing that he's going to do that work in them. Paul saying he was confident of the very thing that he which had begun a good work in you. I'm confident that as you hear this word preached, I'm confident that as you as as you come here week by week that God is going to do a work in your heart and in your life. You can be confident in your children, in your spouse that God's going to move. Amen. As we trust him. And when they they get that word that gospel, being confident of this very thing that He which has begun. You see, it's God who does the work in us. Not we ourselves. He is the one who performs that work. We are His workmanship. Mm. I am. He is the potter and we are the clay. Mold me and make me. Is that your prayer today? See, that even rhymed with it, didn't it? Be confident to know to know that He's going to do that. He's going to perform that. Being confident of this very thing, that He which has begun a good work, you see, everything God does is good. Amen. We need to understand that as well. <clears throat> I think it was hit upon last weekend. And I know I've said it before, maybe I was just thinking it. But everything God does in our lives is good. And for Hmm. Sometimes that's hard to swallow and hard to realize. Sometimes what we're going through, that fiery trial, we're like, God, how can this be good? But know this. If God has allowed it, it's for your good. And your good is what's going to come out of it. So long as we trust in Him and we don't go off trying to fix it ourselves. Hmm, that's our problem. Lord will start moving in our kid's heart and life. Mm, what was it I was reading a long time back? We're the greatest hindrance to the work of the cross. In our children, our spouse, our whatever. We can be the greatest hindrance to the work of the cross in their lives because we interfere with what God's trying to do. Sometimes God's got to bring us down. Sometimes we have to go through that fire that's been... Heat it up seven times more for God to show us that He's able to take care of us in that fire, in that situation. Being confident of this very thing, that He which has begun a good work in you, get this, whenever He begun it, whenever it started, He said He will perform it. 
He will make sure that it comes to fruition. I'm going to see what I put on that note. Bring it to completion. That's what that perform. That God will bring it to completion. Like I was saying, a lot of times we try to complete it and we mess things up. We need to be letting Him complete it in us. And notice He says here, until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul leaves no, no doubt in the mind of the Philippian believers here. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Jesus is coming back. And He's also saying this trial, this work, whatever's going on in your life, it's not going to last forever. Amen. It's not going to keep on, keep on. It's not going to be something that, 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 that just hangs around. But there is going to be an end to the trial. Whether that end comes at whatever time God designs, or whether that end comes when Christ returns to take us home with Him, there will be an end. And then there will be no more trials. Amen? We can have confidence. We can rest. Saying, Lord, whatever I go through today... Whatever the trial, whatever the fire, Lord, I know, what does the Scripture say? It came to pass. We, we read that, and it came to, we use that in a in kind of a, 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 a misquoted kind of way, but it came to pass. Whatever the trial you're going through, it's not going to last forever. You hear that? It's going to come to an end. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Hang on is what Paul's saying here. Hang on. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't jump ship. Don't throw over. Don't do away. Don't quit the race. Keep on keeping on as a good soldier. Stay dug in in the fight and don't give up because God is on His way. God is going to move. He's going to bring about the end, the completion of this that you're going through. Just trust Him. Keep trusting Him. Oh, I've been trusting Him. Well, keep trusting Him again. What is it? Sweeter and sweeter as the day goes by? How's the rest of that? Something with the Lord and I? Keep trusting Him. Amen? Being confident of this very thing, that He which has begun a good work in you will, not might, He will perform it until the day of Christ. Even as it's meet or necessary for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. You notice that? Paul is saying, because of your joint participation, because of your fellowship, you're all partaker of that grace that God has shed abroad. You're a part of, you're a sharer in that grace. He says, for God is my record. God is my, that word record there means God is my witness. God is my witness. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. That's a, a term there that we don't use a lot today, but those bowels of Jesus, that speaks of in my heart in the heart of Christ, in the tender-heartedness of Christ. He says, For God is my record. i got a red note, so we got to read it. Paul desires in his heart of hearts that these saints will be growing ever more in Christ, learning what it is that He has done for them, and walking in that which is theirs in Christ, not lacking in even one area. Not lacking in even one area. That was the desire that Paul had for these saints in Philippi. This, oh my, if this was the desire of every preacher in the pulpits today, in the churches today, that we would see the people grow in the grace and in the knowledge of all that Christ has done for them at Calvary to grow in what it is that's ours in Christ, that inheritance that He has given us because of what He did for us at Calvary. How much more would the church be walking in power, in love, in unity, in might? How much more? I think I said it Thursday night. The devil, he don't care if you're a believer. He just don't want you to be a mature believer. Because a mature believer, somebody who's walking in all that Christ has done, knowing what Christ did for us at Calvary, knowing who we are in Christ, knowing the inheritance that we have in Christ, 
That believer is a threat to the enemy. That believer is one who will stand up and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. <coughs> that believer is one who will say, Be cast out, you demon spirit. That believer is one who will be laying hands on the sick, who will be gone as Paul and or not Paul, but Peter and John on the way to the temple when the man stuck out his hand and he said, give me a dollar. Peter and John said, we ain't got no money, but what we have, do we have it in the church today? What we have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. The man that was lame from his mother's womb, the man that they took daily and laid there to ask of alms in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh my. A church, a people, and it don't have to be a lot. It could be just us here. Those listening on Facebook or YouTube, Dynamite Radio. It could just be those few walking in the power and the might of the Spirit of God, knowing what it is, but sure. Like I said, He don't care if you're a believer. He just don't want you maturing. He don't want you growing in what the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. He wants to keep you dumbed down. That's an enemy tactic. We see it in our schools today. Oh, we don't need to teach them reading, writing, and arithmetic. We need to teach them how to be whatever. As long as we don't teach them the right stuff. We need to teach them homosexuals are okay. Critical race theory is okay. Dumbing them down. Don't let the enemy dumb you down. Be knowing what this word says. Be knowing what is yours in Christ. Amen. Being confident. <clears throat> we already read that. For God is my record, my witness. How greatly I long after you in the bowels of Christ. And this I pray. Hmm, he's still praying for him. This I pray. That your love. That there's the agape love of God. That's that love that the Holy Spirit spreads abroad in our hearts. <clears throat> I want to read <clears throat> what Wiest has to say about that. He says, The love that's spoken of here is the love that God is, produced in the heart of the yielded believer by the Holy Spirit. Its chief ingredient, self-sacrifice for the benefit of the one who is loved. You hear that? The chief way that this love, this agape love is shown, is self-sacrifice for the one... Are we willing to give up of ourselves? Are we willing to be ridiculed? Here's where it hits home. Are we willing for somebody to think us weird? To call us a religious fanatic? To call us a Jesus freak? Are we willing to suffer shame for the cause of Christ? You see, if men shame you, Big stinking deal. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Oh God, For it is the power of God unto salvation. What do we have to be ashamed about? The God who created the universe, who is our Father, gave His only Son that we might be saved and reconciled back to Him. Where's the shame in that? Mm. The world needs to be ashamed of itself because it rejects what Christ did. Shame on you if you reject the greatest gift ever given to mankind. Shame on you if you say, I'm going to go and live my life the way I want to live my life. What was it some atheist just said? Um, <clears throat> I ain't afraid to spend eternity in hell. In that statement alone, he's, he's acknowledging God. Though he says, I'm an atheist. He's a fool. Shame on you. Shame on us if we don't declare this gospel. Amen. 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 Yes. Finish reading that. It's chief ingredient, self-sacrifice. This is speaking of that love of God. 
self-sacrifice for the benefit of the one who is loved and its constituent elements analyzed for us in 1 Corinthians 13. Go read 1 Corinthians 13 when you get home. He says, This divine love, an exotic flower from heaven, planted in the foreign soil of the believer's heart, was existing in superabundance in the heart of these Greeks, speaking of these Philippians, who had been saved out of gross paganism and was overflowing into the hearts of others. Oh my. Paul prays that it might increase. Is that love of God overflowing in our hearts to others around us? We need to ask ourselves that question. Is it overflowing? Is it abounding in the hearts of believers that it might overflow? If that love was abounding and overflowing, we'd see a whole lot more people saved today. Let that love dwell in you richly. This I pray. This is what we need to be praying for one another. Mm. Wouldn't be no church fights over the carpet if we had this kind of love, would there? <laughs> the color of paint or whatever. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Hmm. Hmm. <gasps> don't be judging no you can judge some things you better be judging some things that's what he's talking about here verse 10 that you may approve things that are excellent he's talking about doctrine here you better be judging the doctrine that you're hearing the teaching that you're hearing come across TV, the pulpit, wherever you better be making a judgment is that doctrine correct does that doctrine line up with Christ and Him crucified you hear me you hear me Facebook you better be judging. You better be making some judgment because if you don't and you just swallow it all hook, line, and sinker, you're going to be like that fish. You're going to be caught and put in the frying pan. <clears throat> that you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense. Here's his second reference to the second coming, till the day of Christ. But going back up to that, approving those things that are excellent, that speaks of doctrine. And what flows out of that, that you may be sincere and without offense. That's talking about being without spot or wrinkle. What Paul would say in other places, without spot or wrinkle. In Ephesians chapter 5, Sincere, pure, unsullied, freedom from spot or blemish to such a degree as to bear examination in the full splendor of the sun. You see, if we're listening to false doctrine and we're, be, we're le being led astray by false doctrine, there's no way we're going to be without spot or wrinkle. There's no way we're going to be sincere and without offense. Yeah. <clears throat> there's no way that we can approve those things that are excellent because we don't know. You can't walk in what you don't know. You can't have faith in what you don't know. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He says, being filled with the fruits of of righteousness. This is what should be in the heart and life of every believer. We should be being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by or through Jesus Christ. And what it does is it brings glory and praise to God. He's speaking about our lives. We need to be praying this prayer. As we saw in Ephesians, that prayer that, that, that Paul was praying for the Ephesian church. We need to be praying this for one another, for our friends, our family, whoever. We need to be praying this, that, the, that, being, that they would be being filled with the fruits of righteousness, that which comes from a personal relationship with Christ. Amen. What are those fruits of righteousness? Amen. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, Amen. the fruit of the Spirit, and so much more. Amen. The fruits of righteousness which come through Jesus Christ and give glory and praise yes. to God. Our lives <clears throat> should be bringing glory and praise to God in every area, not just in church life, not just here on Sunday morning or Thursday night, but at work, oh my, at home. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
and gave himself for it. We said that a few weeks ago when we looked at Ephesians. If we're pretending or we're saying we're understanding the message of the cross, the first place it's going to be evident is in our homes. And from there it's going to flow out everywhere else. And that don't mean it ain't going to bring some strife and some, some contention because some will believe and some won't even in the same home. But you keep trusting the Lord. Amen. Amen. You keep believing for that unbelieving spouse. You keep believing for that unbelieving brother or sister or mother or father or whoever they might be. You keep preaching the gospel. You keep giving them the love of Christ. Amen. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. Amen. Well, we got that saying, kill them with kindness. You know? Keep showing them yes. the love of Christ. He was willing to sacrifice himself for us. Are we willing to sac our, sacrifice ourselves for others? We say we love them. Do we really? Right. Yeah. Mm. Some hard questions we got to ask ourselves there. This is just the introduction of Paul's letter here. There's going to be a whole lot more better, gooder stuff in here as we go through it. You know, <clears throat> somebody asked me the other day, what's your favorite verse of Scripture? I said, well, whatever one I'm just reading right now. <laughs> You know, same way with whatever book I'm reading. That's my favorite book at the time because there's always good stuff there. Yes. It's always good, Amen. never bad. Let that love fill your hearts this morning. Thank you, Lord. Let that love be overflowing. That agape, unconditional, unselfish love, that love that gives itself for the benefit of the one loved. That's not a, there's no way. That's not a worldly love. There's no way the world can produce that love. The love that the world has is a selfish love. Mm -hmm. When that young man tells that young lady, Oh, I love you so much. Let's go do this. Mm -mm. He don't love you. If he loved you, he'd be saying, I want to keep you pure and I want myself to be pure Amen. for you. Yes. Mm. Let's love one another. Amen. Let's stand. May, if you have a song. <clears throat> this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That your love may abound. We need to be praying that for one another. Do you know the love of God today? Have you experienced that love? If you haven't, you can. Whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube, whether you're here this morning, God wants to shed that love abroad in your heart. He wants to let you know that you are loved. I am the beloved and the beloved is mine. I am the beloved. Something like that. That's how that song goes. Let God show you that love in Christ. Give your life to Him. It'll be the best decision you ever made. If you're having trouble loving your brother and sister, sometimes we need to go and read those books that John wrote. He that loveth God loves his brothers and sisters. Let that love be in your heart today. Amen. Let the Holy Spirit work that in you today. If anybody needs prayer this morning, if anybody wants to give their life to Christ this morning, just come on up here. Kneel at these chairs. These are our altars. And give your life to Him today and experience that love. Amen? Let's sing this song. Anybody who will, let them come. Come unto me. be your prayer this morning that he would draw you I guarantee you he'll answer it Lord draw me nearer to you closer closer than ever before
never pray a better prayer than to ask the Lord to draw you near to Him. And when you pray it, expect Him to. And then when He does, run to Him. Run to Him. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank You this morning. I thank you for that love that you have for us, Lord, that you gave your only Son. I thank you, Father, for that price that you paid, Lord, so long ago on that cross, that you shed your blood and you gave your body, that we could be in fellowship with you, Father. Lord, help us to take that word to a lost and dying world. Help us, Father, to not be timid, Lord, or to shrink back, Lord, whenever... Lord, we have that opportunity, but to stand boldly, Lord, and to declare that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by the Son. Lord, give us boldness, give us strength, Lord, to take this gospel to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.